friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. It's been a long time coming. We wanted to uh, get this video out to you much sooner, but the guitar fought me every step of the way, and you'll see that in the video. And yes, this video is nearly two hours long. I hope you think it's worth it. It took Melissa well over a week to put this together. There was just hundreds of clips and, uh, you know, and there a lot of length to them too. I mean, if we would have put this out, it would have, you'd have to watch it for 12 hours <laughs> straight to, to see all the video clips. We cut out as much as we can. We know that some of you watch just for entertainment value purposes, you know, like going to the movies. And in that case, you'll like the long video and others, watch for the technical aspect to learn stuff and in that case I think you'll like the video. Some of you, I'm not sure why you watch because you always complain that the videos are too long or whatever. Sorry, you're, you're going to be hating this video because it's forever long. If you want to skip to the end, there's a lot of picking on this uh, video and we're also going to put out a subsequent video with an S on it where I do some more um, songs on the guitar. So, I hope you enjoy all this. Uh, please let it play if you can because that helps the channel out. Thank you for watching. The guitar has been drying for about a solid week. I'm ready to do some sanding to try to level the finish down and start filling the grain. As you can tell, there's almost no grain filling going on yet. That's just the nature of lacquer. I've probably got 15 coats of lacquer on here already. You can just see that it doesn't go into the pores. But if you sand it off pretty flat and then do it again, well then each time those pores are a little bit more filled. It just takes forever. I'm understanding that there's some pink in this area here which is from the red bleeding over. A lot of the binding probably has a little pinkish cast to it and there's not much I can do about that. I hate it but it just happened that way. In the future I think what I'm going to do is put some kind of a sealer coat on this red before I actually put the binding on. That's what I think I'm going to try to do in the future. I got most of the red out of this but there's still some there and it's just the way it is. Unfortunately I wish it wasn't that way. If the customer isn't happy with it well like I said I'd be glad to keep it because it's a great guitar so now I'm just going to do a ton of sanding I'm really not going to film much of that I may just show a little bit of it but it's just going to be wet sanding with like 320 or something in that range the air conditioning's on sorry about that I'm not going to do much talking but I'm using 220 wet or dry sandpaper I was going to use 320, but I found the 220 first, and I thought, you know, as rough as this is, as much sanding as it needs, I might as well go with that first. The guitar has been sitting for more than a week. It's looking really nice, but it's not filled on the grain at all, really. We're gonna have to sand it completely down again and then redo it. You know, if you don't wait a week though, then you don't really know how much uh, you've got to sand down. It's shrunk pretty much all it's gonna shrink now after a week. It'll probably continue to shrink for a while, to be perfectly honest, but you know, proportionally, it shrunk about as much as it's gonna shrink. So, we just need to get busy and sand. The thing about this is, is you really have to sand off 95% of what you've got on there in order to make any difference. I know people say there's all kinds of grain fillers, but the problem with using grain fillers on this wood is this wood changes color a lot over time and if you put something in there that's, that matches the color today, well then it won't match later and you see all the pores. So it, to me, it just looks better when you do it this way. If you had a totally clear filler, then it would be all right. And yes, I know about glue boost and all those other super glue type finishes and I can't stand them. I, my eyes are so sensitive to those things, I just can't be in the same room with them. I don't like to use shellacs under it because shellacs turn uh, milky white if you sweat. I'm just not a fan of the shellac deal, even though it would work. You know, it's just a ton of elbow grease to make it look good, but it will eventually look really good. So I'm not gonna film any more of this because 
it would just be wasting a lot of camera time. Well, my friends, I've spent hours sanding this body. It's a lot smoother. It looks bad right now because again, we're back in that ugly duckling thing again. It looks bad to be perfectly honest with you. I sanded through a little bit right here and a little bit maybe right in here. You'd think that'd be terrible, but it really doesn't hurt anything. When you put the lacquer back on there, it goes right back. You can't tell it. And same way here, I sanded through a little bit. But I'll tell you what is bothering me about the guitar, and that is that this stain is still just bugging me. I don't know, it's hard to show because I have to get the neck toward the camera and the light is in the way and all that. So let's see if we can get the camera to focus on that part right there. The staining there is just driving me crazy. I'm gonna go ahead and rip it out. I know a lot of you knew I would do that anyway, but the truth is I was gonna leave it. After sanding so much on it and knocking it down, I thought, well, this if I'm gonna do it, this is the perfect time to do it. Here's the problem. I seriously think these are my odds. I think there's a 60% chance, that's more than 50, 60% 60 chance that it's just gonna be a disaster, that I'm gonna regret doing this. I, there's that much chance. I really feel that, that that's the potential. There's about a 25% chance it'll just go okay. You know, like it'd be fine. There's about a 15% chance that it'll be real good. You know, that I'll be going, all right, I'm really, really, really happy I did that. <laughs> that's what I'm shooting for is that 15% chance. And I seriously believe those are about my odds. I, I do believe that. I'm not just saying that for the camera. You know, people are always saying, oh, just take the back off the guitar. You're, you're wasting your time working through the sound hole. You just have no idea how tough that is. You truly don't. If you say that, you just don't know how tough that is. When you start taking this off, now this is real wood binding. So when I start routing this, I mean, there's no taking it out with a knife. It's just impossible. Old plastic binding would just break and be brittle and crack and bust, and you'd have to replace it all anyway. So that's one of the reasons you don't do it on an old guitar, because you never get your binding back on it. A new guitar with new binding, you might get the binding off and put it back, but generally you can tell it. This new guitar with more or less new binding, because it's wood binding, I can make a replacement. I can route all this out, I hope. But the problem is tear out, you know, and I don't know if I'm gonna get tear out around where the binding is glued to the wood, to the back and sides. If I don't get too much tear out, we'll be fine. If you get very much tear out, it's a total disaster. And you don't know what you're gonna get until you start. Once you start, you can't stop. Yeah, I don't mean to make it sound so negative, but it's just a reality. It's just black and white. And if you've ever done this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Once you start, you're committed. You can't undo it. It's just like the bullet on the gun. Once you pull that trigger, you're committed. It's already, that bullet's going. You can't pull it back now. And that's the way this is. Once you start, you're headed down the path and you cannot come back up the path. So wish me luck. Here we go. Well, friends, the best laid plans of mice and men. You probably thought I would have already started on that guitar based on that last clip, but it's 24 hours later and I have yet to start on it. I had intended to do just that, to get started on routing that binding back out of that guitar, but no sooner than I made that clip than I found out that the internet wasn't working. And you might think, well, that's not that big a catastrophe, but it is when you're trying to run a business and Melissa's in there in the office and can't do a thing because nothing works. And not to mention that the internet's off at our house too because of the internet being off down here at the shop. It's very complicated and I won't go into all that, but I spent the biggest part of yesterday working on fixing that. And all I did was put a Band-Aid on it. It's still not fixed well enough, but it's at least we can limp along. So that brings me to today while I'm waiting on a new router. And uh, I thought this shirt just sums it all up. It's just not easy being me. So what's the predicament here? Let me just point the camera down at the table and I'll show you the things I'm running into. I set up the router. Uh, this is that uh, new Proxon router. Set it up for cutting the binding slot. I made this adapter here for cutting slots, but you know, I didn't actually make it where it works for guitar binding. 
it works for peghead binding real well. You know, I didn't think about the depth of this kind of binding when I made this. And so I need to put a shim in here to raise this up some from the bit so I can extend the bit a little deeper because right now I'm only cutting about two thirds the depth of this binding that I need to put on the guitar. That's the first thing is I have to shim this out some. I think I'm going to create two shims out of this thin aluminum. This aluminum is approximately 60 thousandths, which is about the thickness of the binding, by the way. Not that that really is significant, but that way I can shim it out 60 thousandths or 120 thousandths, uh, depending on what I need to do. I did test several bits, and I wanted to show you the problem with the bits. This is the typical bit that I use. Now, it's very aggressive. It cuts really well, but it's super aggressive. It's got the two carbide cutters on the edges. It does a nice job, it cuts a nice slot, but it can, it can also chip and tear really badly because of just the two teeth. So therefore, I'm not going to even try that because I'm just afraid I'll tear something up with that, even though it does cut a nice slot. So that brought me to my old Reliable, which is a great old cutter, but it's very slow. You can see it's a spiral multi-tooth cutter. It's just high-speed steel. It's not carbide. And the simple fact is these cut really slow. They burn a lot. They're just crummy, really. I mean, if it was carbide like this, it might be fine. But this high-speed steel dulls very quickly. I've wore out so many of these bits, I can't even tell you. This is the old 115. So I thought I'd go to the store and get me a brand new 115. So here's what the new 115 looks like. And you can see it's a straight cutter. There's no spiral to it at all. Now, I am positive that that's a cost savings right there to make the, the bit much easier. But common sense tells me that that will be more likely to tear and grab and things because it's not cutting on a spiral. It's just going to knock chunks of wood out. And I'm a little bit afraid of that, just kind of like I'm a little bit afraid of this. I haven't tried this yet, so I shouldn't knock it till I try it. You know, that's their new 115 as opposed to the old Spiral 115. I much prefer the Spiral, but like I said, they didn't hold up anyway. I doubt this one would hold up any better. So I've almost ruled this one out just because I'm not crazy about the design. Although, I may still try it. So I spent $10 on those just to have them in stock in case I want to try them. I spent $15 on this thinking this would be much better this is a roto zip tool and it's got the downward spiral similar to the inlay bits that Stumac sells. And I thought this would be perfect because a little bit bigger, this is 5 seconds of an inch. And I thought it had a flat end on it, but it doesn't. It has a drill point end on it. So that's not going to work very well unless I grind that off flat. And I don't know that I want to deal with that. This is carbide. There's another $15 just kind of sitting there that I'm not sure I'll be using. I have some cheap, really cheap Chinesium bits that are spiral cutter, but they also have a very slight drill end on them too. So, you know, and then people say, well, you can go to the box store and get these downward spiral cutters, which are good for, you know, like cutting through drywall and cutting around an outlet or something like that. I mean, they're great for things like that. But number one, I don't think this would hold up. Number two, it's way too long. Too much flex in the thing for cutting stiff hardwood in the binding. And I can't even really adapt it to work well with this. Uh, it's just too long, too awkward. So that's why I bought this one thinking it was so much shorter, you know, that the little cutter is so much shorter. But like I said, th this has a drill point, which I couldn't see in the package in the store. So where does that leave me? I don't like any of those cutters. So what I tried then, or what I did put in, and I you probably can't see it very well being in cutter here. So I, I took one of the inlay cutters from Stumac. Now this is their one of their larger ones. This is the 1 8 inch. Basically it's made exactly like this. I do know these inlay uh, cutters, these downward inlay cutters, really do a fine, smooth job. They don't tear out anything. And so that's the bit I'm going to use. All that to tell you that that's what I'm using. But you know, I did consider a ton of things and I 
I did cut a slot here as a test, and like I said, it's not deep enough, but you can see how perfect it cut and how smooth it cut, how clean it cut. Um, not even a burr anywhere. So that is definitely the bit I'm gonna go with. As you recall, when I first reviewed this, I wasn't crazy about how rough the bottom of this was. So I did find some of that highly slick tape and I forget the letters on it already. But anyway, it's, I do have the tape on here. It's slicker than snot on a doorknob. I mean, it really is slick now and that'll keep it from scratching up the top of the guitar. Here we are back to where we started this little clip and that is that we need to make something to raise this up uh, so that I can get more depth. So here's how I'm making those shims. I'm just laying the piece over the top. I've got a transfer punch here in the hole. Now I'll look down through there and see if the holes actually line up. Yeah, that looks perfectly centered to me. I'll drill those holes, then I'll cut this out and we'll see how, how it lines up. If that works, I'll use this one as a template to make the second one. In hindsight, these shims are really very helpful in that I can adjust this for all kinds of thicknesses of binding now, where, you know, the way I made it, it would only work on fairly narrow binding. Now it'll work on fairly wide binding, middle size binding, and very narrow binding. And I'm ready to do another test cut and see how it fits up. So here we go. I'm just gonna cut in the same place where I cut before and see what it does. And then we'll move on if we need to. Well, I will say I'm impressed with these Stumac cutters. Those things cut smooth and clean. You know, Stumac doesn't know anything about this. They're not paying me for it. But I am impressed with those cutters. They cut great. Okay, I'm a hair deep. The depth this way might even be a hair deep. I definitely got to shallow it up in both directions a little bit. For the depth, uh, this way it's fairly easy. I can just loosen these two little screws and I can loosen this just a little bit and that'll let the base go up a little bit and cover a little bit more of the bit. So that one's easy. This one's a little more difficult in that I have to slide it in and out. I have to adjust these two allens to do that. Moving it a tiny bit might just be a tough call, but I'm gonna try. I don't know if I moved it any or not. You have to make sure all these allens are good and tight too because you could get started and then have them slip and then you've got trouble. I'm going to check this all out and I'll bring you back when I get satisfied. I am ready to give this a shot. When I say I'm ready, I'm not ever going to be ready. I just have to do it. Mentally, I'm just not wanting to do this at all, but I think I just need to. I've checked it and tested it every way I know how to check it and test it, so it's just time to do it. It's either going to go okay or you're going to see a man cry right on video here. So here we go. It's not great, I can tell you that. It looks like it might be all right. I'm not quite sure why it's leaving a little bit of wood in places and not in others. It could just be so much easier if it would just be easy. And nothing's ever easy. The truth is, I don't know what I ended up with. That's the truth. You know, if you don't know anything about curly maple, if you've never worked with it, you have no idea how brittle and how much it wants to bust and tear out and break. I knew I was going to be in for trouble. At least on the surface, it looks like it was about as good as I could have expected. From that perspective, I guess I'm good. I've set both dimensions about five thousandths of an inch deeper, less than that actually, and I'm going to try to go around it one more time to clean it up as a cleaning pass. So. Here we go. Have to clean it up by hand from here out. I don't know how bad this is gonna wash out on this white table, but anyway, I've got the best edge of the two pieces of binding 
up, take a sanding block and just try to sand both of those good edges good and flat so they'll fit in the groove real tight against the side of the guitar. I think I'm ready to start trying to put it back together. Let's see how that goes. Well, I've spent a lot of time cleaning up everything. I've got all the, you know, binding slots cleaned up and the binding is clean, so I think I'm ready to put it back together. Really pulling that as tight as I can get it. You know, you can pull so tight you'll break the tape, but I'm pulling right up to that bleeding edge, I think. Well, I'm not gonna shoot any more of this video. I'm, you see what I'm doing, and we'll show you what it looks like when we're finished. Getting right down to the brass tacks here, that last little joint, and I wanna try to make that match up where you can't tell it. It's very difficult to do, so I'm just gonna try cutting it by hand with the X-Acto knife. Of course, it ain't gonna match the first time or two. You just kind of have to sneak up on it. I've said that a lot, and that, but that's the way you have to do things like this. You, you never cut it all at once, and if you try, you're making a mistake. You might get lucky, but if you want it to be airtight, you kind of have to sneak up on it. You might have got it there. Yeah, I think that'll do it. I'm going to put a little more glue in there just because the glue's had a little time to dry. Take the brush and move it around a little bit. Get it up on the end of the piece. But that ought to do it now. I think that's perfect. You really can't even hardly tell where one piece starts and the other one stops. There's glue on there to make a mess, but otherwise you can't hardly tell. It's right there is the seam. Pretty tight. That's what you want. Looks real good. I'm gonna give the whole thing 24 hours to just sit and relax, and then I think it's more for me to relax, to be perfectly honest with you. And then tomorrow we'll tackle cleaning it back up, and hopefully by tomorrow afternoon or sometime we'll be able to spray the next coats of lacquer on this thing and keep moving. 24 hours have gone by. This has been sitting. I think I did a real good job of getting it real tight, so that part I'm good with. Now we'll just have a lot of cleanup and get it ready for the next coats of lacquer. But we gotta get the tape off of it first, and hopefully we won't have any damage from the tape. And you never know about these things. It'll take me a little while to peel all this off of here, and I don't really see any point in you watching me do that, so we'll show you what it, the next step looks like. Well, you know, just so that I have an a few more problems. The tape stuck really good and therefore I have to get all this tape residue off. I'm using uh, just Zippo lighter fluid for that. That's one of the best things you can do to get sticky tape off of a instrument or whatever. Doesn't seem to hurt the finish any and of course I've never really gone right over the top of this with lacquer so you know as far as I know I won't have any problem but but then again, I don't know everything about this. Well, I think that got rid of 99% of the tape residue on the back. Now we'll have to do the sides. There's just tons of work to make the new binding fit up okay. I'm going around it with this uh, X-Acto knife. With that curved blade, that lets me get right up to, at, to the edge of this without actually getting out on top of it. If you try to use a straight blade, then you're gonna scratch this out here. So it works good if you really take your time and are very careful about it. But this kind of wood is hard to scrape because it's so um, curly. The grain going different directions and this thing grabs that grain. So you have to go left, then you have to go right. Then you, you, know, you just have to go back and forth until you get it smoothed out. Well, my friends, the guitar is looking much better again. <laughs> I get happier when it looks better. <laughs> it just wasn't a happy time yesterday. But you know, it ain't perfect. Uh, there's still lots of little stuff. I think I'm gonna have to do some light 400 sanding, uh, you know, pretty much over the whole binding because that was that binding's first coat. And it's, it roughed the binding up. It made, you know, the grain raises just a little bit and stuff. And then there's a little bit of roughness right where the binding and the sides meet. So, you know, I'm just gonna smooth that out. I got some 400 here and I'm gonna go to work on that. 
First, I'm going to take off this little hanger because I don't want it to get beat around and scratch the instrument. This is how I hang them. Um, it's just a coat hanger wire, you know, bent it, where it, a screw fits down through it. And the reason I do that is that way I can spin it and I can hold it by my finger like this while I'm spraying it and I can spin it. I can actually take my finger and spin the screw and the instrument will spin while I'm holding it and that's pretty handy too. So anyway, that's just the way I do it. Melissa said I'm my own worst critic on this, but uh, I got to be honest, it's still got a lot of little flaws. I mean, I'm not going to try to fool anybody. There's little flaws right around the edges here, but I think about 90% of that is going to go away. And those flaws are much more minor compared to that huge discoloration that we had. So it's overall, it's a huge improvement, I think. Keep in mind, this was just two light coats of lacquer that went on this, so you know it needs at least eight or ten more coats before we really give it a good another sanding. Hopefully, it'll be the final sanding, but to be honest, I doubt it is. I bet I end up doing it at least two more times. There's still a lot of grain that's not filled. You can probably see up close, you can see there's still a lot of pores, but not nearly as many as we started with, but still a lot. This is 400 wet or dry, and I'm just using it dry. Once again, it's not real exciting watching me just do this for an hour, so I'll show you what we look like uh, after we're finished with that and ready to put the final finishes on it. Well, my friends, I told you it would be a while before this puppy got finished. It's been weeks and weeks and I've put tons and tons of finish on here and you can still see there's still little places that haven't filled yet. So here I go sanding it down yet again probably for about the fourth time. Well that's quite a bit of elbow grease just on the back there. Yeah, it's not too bad, but there's a lot left that's not full yet. We got some more sanding to do. We'll get rid of at least half of those, I think, by the time we're done sanding. Quite a bit around the bottom edge that you might be able to see better. Bottom edge there, I don't know if that shows up in the light or not. It's hard to tell on the camera. But anyway, there's quite a bit. So I'm not gonna use any more film on that. I'm just gonna work on that until I get satisfied. It's looking real nice, but it's just taken a ton of work. I can't even tell you how many times I put it on and taken it off and put it on and taken it off. And it's still got lots of little fill spots. I don't know how well they're showing up in the light, but there's like little dimples and little things in places. And I just want them all to go away and leave me alone and they won't. So I'm going to now do drop fills on all the little spots that I can find. I'm not really gonna bother showing that, but basically I just take a toothpick and touch each spot. And like there's a little spot right here. And you know, and I think I remember seeing one up in here somewhere, like right here. And so I'm just gonna take a toothpick and just drop fill all those with brushing lacquer at this point. Once all of those dry, then I'll sand those as smooth as possible and hopefully put one more coat of lacquer over this thing and buff it out. And that's where I think I'm at. I hope that's what proves to be the truth. Friends, if things don't blow up on me again, like they usually do, I think I'm ready to finish this thing. Well, when I say finish, I still have several processes I have to do to it. But to me, that's getting down to the finish. One is I have to put the bridge on it. It don't have a bridge. Two, I have to drill all the peg head holes. And some people would say, why didn't you drill those holes ahead of time? Well, I've done it that way before. And the problem with that is that it, the finish always sucks in around those holes and it leaves a divot around the holes and it just makes a big ugly mess there too. So it's easier for me to do it this way, but then you're taking a huge risk when you drill in the holes. It's nerve wracking to say the least. Like I always say, it's just not easy being me. And that's the only thing I can attribute it to. Here we go. By the way, today, for calendar purposes, today is April 6th, Monday, April 6th, 2020. I'm approximately a month behind where I thought I should have been on this. I thought I would have had it finished 
in early March rather than early April. But at least we're getting it finished. The tape comes off and, you know, I have to make a nut for it too. Have to make a saddle, have to set it, set it up, do a fret job probably. Yeah, I'm sure I'll have to do a fret job. Leveling that is, leveling and recrowning, because you know, just driving them in and, and you're not ever done that way. You always have to do more. But at least it's starting to look really nice. It's going to be a nice looking guitar. Well, I can't start with the bridge until I do the tuners because I have to set my uh, two E strings up in order to uh, test the intonation to put the bridge in the right place. So obviously the very next step is drilling the holes. What a nerve wracking experience this will be. Melissa is going to drive the uh, drill press for me while I hold everything steady. I have boards clamped on top and bottom both and the things that are clamped onto it have been sanded extremely smooth so that they won't scratch anything. That will keep any tear out from happening in the wood. So here we go. Well, there you go. You saw what we did. Now we'll unveil it and see what it looks like. Okay, let's take the last clamp off and see what it looks like. And that one's off. I can see the holes went all the way through. That one's off. It looks pretty good. There's just a tiny bit of shattering right around the finish there. Those ferrules will cover that, so I think we're in good shape. The backside looks fine too. I don't see any real problem at all. So I think we did good. Well, that nerve wracking part is out of the way. Except that we still have to drill holes for the ferrules. That's still nerve wracking. These holes are just clearance holes and they're just barely clearance holes for the tuning keys themselves. I like to drill them tight because that way there's no play in anything. They're not crazy tight, they just fit in perfect. When you lock them down, then they don't move. The string action can't pull it one way or the other. Okay, I checked the fit on this one. It's not perfect by any stretch. I think I've straightened the bit a little bit better. And the bit itself is perfectly fine. It's a brand new bit. Uh, it's this darn chuck. You know, I bought a new chuck for this drill and sometimes you chuck up something and it's perfect. Other times you chuck it up and it's got run out. And you have to monkey with it and monkey with it. So I guess I'm just gonna get rid of this chuck and buy another new one. In the test wood, it fits absolutely perfect. In the test boards I try, it's just my luck. I don't know why things happen that way with me, but that's not wobbling now. That was a good hole. And honestly, this hole's a tiny bit tighter than this one, but it's still a loose fit. And I don't know why, because like I said, I tested it on test wood two or three times and it worked perfectly. It's just that Rosa thing. I don't know how to explain it other than that. Well, no real damage. There's a little bit of a chip right there, unfortunately. Doggone it anyway. But I hope the ferrule will cover that. If not, I got some repair to do right there. Just not easy being me. As I believe you've heard me say before, on the big things in life, I'm probably the luckiest man in the whole world. I really am. On the little things in life, look out. I'd be lying if I said it went perfect because it didn't. See that? It won't go down. Why won't it go down? Because it's hitting this curve. Has that ever happened before? Well, truthfully, I think it did happen once or twice before, but I thought I had that resolved. The only thing I can think of is my new, you know, template is just slightly back a little further than the last template I used. I don't know. I, I thought I used the exact same template to transfer. Some things I just can't explain. Other thing I can think of is I just didn't push this through as far as I typically push it through on the sander. And I guess that's probably the issue. So how do I resolve it? I could just cry. Because, you know, you're at the end here. I want to finish this guitar. There's only two ways I can see to fix this. One is to take more wood out of here, which is probably the right way to do it. The other way would be to bend the tail of this up. I think I could get by with bending the tail up and make it match the curve. But these are very expensive tuners. I hate to experiment. I've done that before. I know I have, but to a lesser degree. This one's going to take a little bit more, but not so much that it wouldn't work. If it was bent, it would just look natural. It wouldn't look weird or anything. You know, these four holes here 
are relatively loose. And when I say relatively loose, they sort of, you can see it doesn't just fall in, but they're kind of loose. This one's, this one's a little better fit than this one. This one's pretty loose, it falls in. All the rest of them pretty much fall in. These four just fall in, same way here. These two are relatively snug, tight fits. Now, riddle me this, Batman. They were all four drilled with the same drill bit. All four were done identical. I mean, like as close to identical as you can get. How does stuff like that happen? Now, admittedly, this first one, there was a little more run out on the bit. It's gonna be fine. We'll just put some, you know, a little bit of a filler type substance in there and it'll be just perfectly fine. Nobody will know the difference. But why did those two turn out perfect and the other four did not? I don't know, have no idea. Same drill bit. And yes, we do have a tiny bit of chip out right there. And somebody would say, well, if you would have taped it off or if you'd have done this ahead of time, no matter how you do it, there's problems. Doing it ahead of time causes all the finish to suck down in the hole and it looks like a volcano going down in there. It it just sucks the finish down in. I've been there, done that a million times. Doing it this way, you risk the chip out. Generally, I don't have any chip out, but this time I did you know, on that one hole. If you put tape over it, when you peel the tape off, you get all kinds of chip out because it just, it always sticks to it. At least that's my luck. Your luck could be different, but that Rosa luck thing just causes it. And I don't know how, what else to do. I mean, you know, come up with all kinds of ideas. I mean, I'm sure I've heard every one of your ideas and I'm sure I've tried every one of them. This is the best way to do it that I've found. Been doing a little bit of work off camera on this guitar and I've started putting the uh, truss rod cover on here. I drilled all the holes for the truss rod screws with this and I just use the tape as a depth stop. As I'm putting the uh, screws in, I'm just coating them with a little bit of beeswax. The first time I drive new screws into any kind of uh, new hole on a guitar, I always use beeswax. It, it makes the screw go in much easier so you're less likely to mess up the head of the screw. It also lines the hole for future uh, in and outs and makes the screw go in and out much easier. It's a good thing to do, I think. Trying not to uh, tighten these screws down very much yet. I'm kind of leaving them just slightly, slightly loose. Got one more screw to go and it's already got the wax on there. Just takes a while to do all the little final touches to every instrument. Okay, I think that's got it. Give you an idea there what it looks like. I started filling these little, the two little chip outs that I had and I've just about got them full. I'm gonna work on them a little bit more. I'll probably take this back off and these back out. I just put those in there just for alignment purposes and uh, I'll probably take all this back off and give this whole peg head one more buff out before I commit to a final version of it. I continue to make progress. I'm lining up the tuning keys, drilling the holes. I've drilled this side already. I'm about ready to do this side. Where this dip was here and the key didn't fit well, I decided to go ahead and do the bending thing and it bent perfectly and matches the curve perfectly. It looks like it's made that way on purpose. So I'm happy with that. I think that was the right decision in this case rather than belabor the whole thing and recut this whole thing. And you know, it's just things you run into when you're building an instrument. And there you go. So again, I'm not gonna show all this. I'm just gonna put the two E strings in right now so I can set the intonation. That's all I really care about at the moment. My friends, had I had a standard dreadnought bridge in stock, I probably would have used that. This is an ebony bridge and it doesn't match the rest of the instrument. Since we used rosewood on the fingerboard, I wanted a rosewood fretboard. So I found a piece of rosewood in my stock that matches pretty well. Then I asked Melissa to see if she could find a bridge design that would be, you know, somewhat different than this, not too crazy complicated, but something nice that uh, would, you know, complement the guitar. I don't like the ones that just go crazy because then it gets too weird looking. But uh, on the other hand, you can improve this, I think, because this is pretty darn plain Jane. So she got all kinds of pictures here. You know, there's this, and that's a little bit much for me because it gets too, um, there's too much design in the edges. Sure, I could inlay a rose on mine and all that, but I've already got enough roses on there, I think, and it's it's getting to be a little bit much. So I'm I've got a big rose for the pick guard, remember? So 
I think I'm going to skip that. This is not strong enough. It's beautiful, but in my opinion, that's not strong enough. I don't really care for that. This one is a on the edge okay. I'm reasonably okay with that one. This one is not too bad. It's got a different shape, but a little modernistic for me. It's just not quite what I'm looking for. Then she also found this picture of something I could do to a future guitar. <laughs> I'm sure I could do that. That would not be that hard actually, but it's not gonna happen on this guitar. This is the one I settled on. You know, it's got just a little bit extra, you know, I've seen similar, but the difference with this one is that it's got, it's dished out behind there and it's, it's just kind of a neat look. I don't know if the picture shows it very well on camera, but it's got a neat look to it. And uh, you know, just enough design twist to make it a little custom look. Yet it's about the same size. Acoustically, it ought to be perfect. So that's what we're gonna try to emulate. I decided the first thing I'm going to do is divide this in halves for symmetry purposes. So I've got the caliper set to half the length and I'll double check it by putting a mark there. Now that I've got the marks established for the center line, I will take my little fine line pencil and draw across the bridge blank. That should be the dead center line. This one has got a very long round uh, back end, which I'm going to try to emulate. This one's probably physically wider than what I have to work with, but I'm just going to make this piece work to a very similar shape. If it doesn't match it exactly, that's okay. What's different than th on this bridge that I like is the way they've scalloped it out here. And I don't, again, I don't know that that's really showing up well, but there's a scallop in this area here, which I think is cool. Rather than the typical scallop that comes right off the end, the scallop comes in at an angle, which I think is really, really cool. And I'm hoping to duplicate that look. Once again, not sure how well that's going to show up, but I have my design penciled in there. The front edge, of course, is just straight, and then I've got the back edge drawn, and it's considerably different than just your standard. It looks quite different. You know, it's got just as much solid wood, not without adding a lot of extra solidness either, though it does have a little bit further back reach, which I think is a good thing. So I think it's going to be overall a very good bridge, a very good acoustic bridge, and then now we're gonna cut out that profile and then we're gonna figure out how to thickness it and get those scallops in there the way we see them in the picture. I believe that looks pretty darn fine. And we should be able to take that to the sander now and you know just work on that and get that real perfect and symmetrical before we start making the rest of it. I've got the bridge in pretty good shape, and now I'm trying to come up with methods that will uh, symmetrically put a dome to this whole bridge. In other words, I'd like to go from the th thinnest part to the thickest part and back down to the thinnest part, and I'd like for it to be very gradual and very precise. So I'm, I've got some ideas in my head about that, and uh, it's a pretty complicated setup that I've got in mind. Complicated, but not that hard to do. In order to do that, I think what I want to do is mount, mount this thing to a board. You'll see what I'm talking about in a minute on the mounting. But in order to mount it, I need some holes drilled through. And I think what I'm going to do is mark the two outside holes. I've got my transfer punches here. This one should fit it pretty close. I've got the piece centered end to end. I just need to hold this up as vertical as possible. And then I'll just tap it lightly to get the point marked. Do the same thing here. Tap it lightly to get the point marked. Now I have my two points there. I will now set up like this. Get I got my center line straight through. Put the pencil in the dot there in the hole. Put my point on the center line and then draw an arc between them. And actually, that bridge probably isn't perfectly symmetrical because the points don't line up perfectly. So that's okay. 
I can just make this point line up by just moving it just slightly. Just very slightly. There we go. Yeah, and it was just half the width of the hole, so it's not much at all. Half the width of the point, I should say. Okay, so now I will need to uh, divide out where I want those other holes on that little arc. I want them to follow the arc of this, and the only reason I want that is because uh, I just think that's more stylish. This this one doesn't do that. This one follows the bridge like like standard, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I just feel like since I'm doing this, I might as well do that with the bridge pin holes as well. I just think it'll look kind of cool, and uh, you know, something you don't see every day, and yet I think it's actually going to be very solid and very good acoustically. So now I just have to decide how to divide out those other spaces. I did some uh, nerdy math off camera to divide out the spacing along this arc. And uh, I'm not going to go into the math, but it worked out fine. I used my calipers to, to mark it within thousandth of inches, so it's working very well. I've already marked it with the calipers, and now I'm just going back and putting the little pinholes there so I know where to drill the holes. Yes, it would be been easier just to put them in a straight line. That's why most people do that. I thought it would look nice this way. And so that's why I decided to do it. Okay, so we've got our six strings. One, two, three, four, five, six, six strings. That's very important because if you only end up with five holes on a six string guitar, you've got a problem. I think I'm gonna go ahead and drill all six of those and uh, have that out of my hair. Once again, I'm having trouble with this uh, run out and I've already got a new one on order, a new chuck, because I just can't stand this chuck anymore. But it's working well enough to use it for this and uh, I've already drilled the one hole. Worked out just fine. Now with the jig I have in mind to cut this radius on this thing, I need the two outside holes to go ahead and have their chamfer so I can put a screw down in there. So I don't care about the rest of them because I'm going to be sanding all this off. This is just temporary really. And I've got them a little deeper than you would normally think you would need them, but this is going to be tapered off, so they're going to be shallower when we're done. In fact, they may not be deep enough. We're going to start with that, see what happens. My friends, I've already got some technology here that I use to put the radius in deer antler saddles for mandolins so that they match the fretboard radius. And this is a 12-inch 12 inch radius, so a 24 inch circle. I think the radius on this needs to be much, much bigger. Because we're dealing with a thin piece of wood, the radius has to go a long way. I don't have any idea what the proper radius is, and I'm sure you mathematicians out there could figure it out mathematically, but I am just going to try the seat of my pants approach, and I'm going to start off with a eight foot radius, which would be a 16 foot circle. You think, how would you do that? <laughs> well, I'll show you here. It's gonna be exactly like this, just much bigger. The first step in making this gigantic radius uh, making jig is to drill a hole in the end of an eight foot long two by four. So if somebody was splitting hairs, then instantly I'm already making it a little shorter than eight feet, but only by about a half inch. So it's not a big deal. Now that will be the hole that I'll put a 16 penny nail in. It will pivot on that nail. It does go through just a little tight. In fact, I might actually even sand it a little bit. But I'll be driving this into another base piece of wood that'll be stationary. Then this will just pivot on this nail. It's gonna be fine the way it is. Well folks, I hope this translates to the video. I have an eight foot long two by four here. It's eight feet goes that direction. I have the new bridge screwed to the end of it here. This would be the top of the bridge, this side here. This is against this, and this is going to cut a radius. Now, as I move this across, it creates a, a very large radius, very large. Probably too large, but I gotta start somewhere. And I'd rather start big than small because you can't undo it once you get it too small. 
I can undo this by just continually moving things closer and making the radius steeper. As perhaps you can see, the 2x4 is back over there. There's a board across that table that keeps it level. Everything's level too, by the way. And there's a nail driven down through that. So it's pivoting on that nail. As long as that table doesn't move, the radius will be good. The table's pretty heavy, so I don't think it'll move. That's just, I'm counting on that. I hope that's true. This is where it gets a little tedious on this end. I have to now adjust it so that, you know, that when it's coming straight on, and by the way, I also have squared this up so that it's pretty darn square. So the length of this touching this face is pretty square. Everything is square. It's hard to explain, but trust me, all of that matters. Now I'm just going to move the table closer until it touches, or almost touches, actually. Well, actually, that's uh, not touching, and uh, I can see the radius that it's going to put on there, and I'd say the radius is going to be shallow, but we're going to try it anyway. I just need to come a little closer. Okay, there, there it is, and now I'd have to come in from the side, I think. We'll see what happens. This could be a total disaster. Well, believe it or not, that did a great job. It made a, a perfect radius. I can see the perfect radius. It's a very, very shallow radius. My guess is I need to shorten it by at least two feet. This is a six foot radius or a 12 foot diameter. Well, I can tell that's closer to what I'm looking for, but still not there. So believe it or not, I'm going to take off another two feet. I didn't bother filming my last attempt because it wasn't right either. I am now at two feet away. So now the board is really short. As a matter of fact, the end of it's just off camera. And I have the same setup otherwise. I just moved the table closer and closer. This is going to now cut a lot more off the ends and leave the middle a little higher. And this is where I need to be, I can tell. So I think two feet may be the final try, but we, you know, we won't know till we try. So here we go. Well, I seriously think that was the final effort. I think we got it there with a two foot radius. We could have started there, of course, if we'd have known that, but we didn't. And uh, like I said, it's, yeah, it's more work sneaking up on it, but you always get the good result that way versus just trying something crazy at the beginning and then you're going, oh no, that didn't work. Well, there's what she looks like with that four foot diameter, uh, you know, circle there or a, tw a two foot radius. Then we're going to scallop out this area here. You know, it's got to be done at kind of an angle. It gets uh, shallower up here and deeper back that way. I'm not sure how I'm going to do that, but I have a feeling it's going to be on my uh, spindle sander. That's where I'm going to go first and we'll see how that works. This wood is not easy to sand, and it, this sandpaper is not the best anyway. I've cleaned it with the rubber cleaner, but it's still not that good. So I think what I'm going to do is change tactics and try my Dremel tool and do this by hand. I think I'm good enough that I can control that and make it pretty darn precise by hand. Here we go with the Dremel. I'm going to see what I can do and see if I can make it work this way. That looks pretty darn cool. If I can uh, make the other one look about the same, then we're pretty much home free. Boy, that's pretty dang close. Just by looking at it by eye, I don't think it's perfect, but it's pretty close. So let me uh, get rid of the pencil marks there and I can analyze it a little bit better. Well, that's looking pretty cool in my eyes. So one of a kind bridge, similar to the one that you see in this picture, but it's not really exactly the same. It's just similar. Their uh, cutouts here are much bigger. And I might go bigger because I like that look. You know, I want to take it slow and it's been a very long day. It's uh, way after normal quitting time for most people. And uh, I think I'm going to quit and look at this in the morning with fresh eyes. And I think that will be a good idea. I'm finished with this bridge and I couldn't be much happier. That is just about as good as it gets for me in terms of uh, a bridge. I could have put on the standard shape bridge. You know, I would have had to buy one of these in rosewood in this shape. But I thought, why put on that standard plain Jane shape when we can really make one that I think looks pretty? 
In fact, I like the shape of this bridge and the feel of this bridge so much that I'm going to use this as my standard for all bridges in the future. So I'm going to trace this very carefully now, make sure all the holes are in the right place, etc. Use this as my pattern for all future bridges. Just thought I'd add quickly that I was going to make a template of this bridge out of plastic. And as luck would have it, I already had a perfect template because I had made this extra thick and then I sawed it thin after I had already cut the shape. And so this template matches this exactly. The holes are exactly in the same place, everything. All of my bridges will be in that shape from the future going on. Friends, <laughs> I know you think I'm joking when I'm talking about the Rosa curse. I'm seriously telling you there's something wrong. Either If it's not a curse, then I just have the worst horoscope in the world. Oh my gosh. I was just putting the very first string on this Carolina Rose guitar. And I have, you know, every I think everybody has stuck themselves with a string before. But have you ever stuck one where it went all the way through your finger? <laughs> That's what happened this time. It went in about right here and came out the end of my finger. And it happened like that. And I don't even know what I did. I swear I don't. It was the end of that string right there. Thank goodness it's brand new. Wasn't rusty. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, the real reason I turned on the camera wasn't to cry about sticking my finger. And notice this was. <laughs> hurt too. I almost cut the whole end of this one off and you think you did it with your saw or your band. No, I didn't even do it in the shop. I was trying to fix a broken trailer hitch and I lifted up on the latch and somehow that finger got in the way and it almost cut the whole end of it off. I'm hoping it grows back. Right now, I can't play anything, just so you know, because <laughs> that one's really tender after running a wire all the way through it. And this one's pretty darn tender after nearly cutting it off. And I'm talking like the whole, you know, like eight to inch, at least an eighth inch down, maybe a quarter inch almost. I wanted to bring you along for the ride here. I'm gonna set the intonation on this. You can see I've got my intonation jig. I have just put the string on here. It is not even tight. I don't even have the grooves set in the nut yet. So there's nothing ready to go. It has not made a single sound yet. I wanted to you to hear the very first sound that it makes. And I will turn the camera back off for a moment and, cu and cut some grooves here, get these two strings on here loose like this. And then as I tighten them up, I'll turn the camera on so you can hear it making its very first noise. Hopefully you can see I've got the two strings on here. They're loose, they're not at all tight. I have not made a single noise on the guitar yet. So let me just kind of measure to see if I've got the bridge about in the right place. Uh, 12 and 5 eighths to the 12th fret there approximately. And we're less than that here, so I need to move this back a little bit. About there maybe somewhere. I mean, that just gets me in the ballpark. About right in there somewhere. All right, so let's start tuning it up a little bit. Hopefully it can at least make a noise. You're getting to hear its very first noises. off of something. I'm not sure what it's buzzing off of because there's nothing to buzz off of it. Isn't that weird? Why is that buzzing? I seriously don't know of anything it's buzzing off of. I guess it just wasn't tight enough. So that's starting to make a noise. Now we'll get the tuner out. And before we even get it up to pitch, I'll check the intonation. All right. There's a B note. That's sharp, so this means this is too short, so we'd have to pull this back some. And I'm gonna try to slide the bridge to get it more centered and just kind of keep everything in alignment here. It just It's gonna take a few trial and errors to get it just where I want it. It's 
still sharp, so we still a little short there, backing this all up a little bit. Getting close now. That's a that's just a B note at the moment. It's not it doesn't really matter that much what the note is too much. At least at the beginning. There's a D note. Well, it's pretty close to right on on that one. Okay. Whoops. I dropped a pick inside. That always helps. Still getting a little bit of a buzzy sound, and it's probably just the way I have that nut cut, apparently, or maybe it's maybe it's off of this saddle because it's just sitting there. to a D there. So we got them both at a D at the moment. Just check intonation again. Pretty close. Pretty close. So that's not too far off. So now, before I get it all the way to pitch, I'm gonna turn my attention to this area and just make sure that this area is set up as well as it can be. So we're just gonna check alignment here. The bridge needs to come this way for center. You know, I'm trying to also square it across the uh, front there. I'm looking at the alignment of the strings down the neck. Bridge-wise, that saddle looks okay where it's at. So I'm gonna move the bridge forward just a hair, not much. Okay, so now it's starting to look pretty good. Let's just check intonation again. Okay, if anything, it's just a hair sharp still on that side. pretty close on that side. All right, let's take it up to full pitch, see what happens. There's the E flat on both sides. There's the E. And there's that E. Getting a little sharp. Not too terribly bad, but a little bit sharp. I don't think the bridge is perfectly square. I'm gonna back it up just a little bit. Perfect. Hair sharp still on the E, on the high E, backing it up just a little bit. Whoops, that's the second or third pick I've dropped in there. I have the dropsies today. That looks pretty perfect. Pretty perfect. Pretty darn perfect. Spent quite a bit of time off camera just putting the final touches on this. All I've really done at this point is locate the bridge where I think it goes and I've also located the saddle where I think it should go. 
I could mark both of them right now and I think I'd be fine. I'm really just debating on whether that's what I want to do or whether I just want to mark the saddle, cut the saddle, and then do the process again. I feel really confident where it's at that it's fine. I really do. If I can get the clamp on here and uh, hold it in place without anything moving, then I think I will just go ahead and cut the finish while I've got this in place. I really have spent a lot of time doing this, so I'm pretty confident that it's perfect. Okay, so now I'm going to get my X-Acto knife out and make sure it's got a very sharp tip, and then we're going to trace around this bridge all the way. Off camera, I've done even more tweaking, and I am pretty satisfied that I've got it where I want it. I took the string off of it. I've got the clamp on it and it's tight. So now I'm just going to trace around this bridge as good as I can without making any mistakes here. Not easy to do, especially with a bridge in a shape like this one. You just don't want to get in any hurry doing this. It's easy to understand why they don't do it this way in factories. It's just way too time consuming, way too precise if you will and really a lot of opportunity to make a mistake. Well that should have it. Take this off and see what we ended up with. The outline is there. Now the question is can we get the finish off without creating any additional problems. I don't know why this finish is as brittle as it is. It's more brittle than most of the finishes I've done in the past. You know keep in mind I've done the same finish in the past. It's the same stuff, same company, everything's the same, but yet this one is much more brittle. Brittle is good in one way in that it should make the tone very crisp and clear. Brittle is bad in another way is that it wants to chip out just doing the least little thing like this. There's something about this instrument that just doesn't like me. I don't know what it is. Pretty sure that everything is cut through well enough. I can feel the grain under there. There's just some things I can't win for no matter what I do, and this is one of them. It's chipping out kind of bad, really. So I'm gonna have to repair the finish in a lot of places. Uh, I just can't win. It's probably the most frustrating instrument I've ever built, and yet it's gonna be one of the finest when I get done, if I ever get done. I don't know why this one has caused me so much trouble. And this is not a candidate, in my opinion, for using the, uh, the sander that I used in the one video. I'd much rather take my time and chip this off. It's going right down to bare wood without any problem, but I don't know why it's so crisp and hard. Really didn't do anything different with this finish than I've done in all the instruments I've built in the past, and this is by far the most crispy finish there is. You look at it wrong and it chips. Well, I'm not gonna film any more of this. I'm just gonna go ahead and get this off of here. You can see what I'm doing, and we'll see where we end up. Probably not the best lighting situation for the viewers because this white background makes it wash out, you know, and everything looks darker. In here it looks bright, but in the camera, looking at there now, the viewfinder, looks like it's going to be kind of dark. But regardless, I have to have it where I can see what's going on. I have the light over there reflecting on the pencil mark that I have, and I have traced it many times. The bridge is down here locked to the table. All I really need to do now is lower the bit and start cutting. To lower the bit, I have to more or less raise the table to compared to the bit. And I'll just lock it down right there. I'm not even sure that's going to, you know, take enough depth. Keep in mind this bridge falls off on each end. I don't know, we're just going to have to give it a shot and see what happens. So here we go. Not bad, not bad. I'm putting the longest saddle I feel like I can get away with on this because the longer saddle transfers the sound better in my opinion. The short saddle just doesn't get it as well. I'm just going to do this by eye and crank it down some more. I'm not even going to worry about the depth at this point because I know it needs to go quite a bit deeper. Lock it in place with these two handles. Make sure I turn it the same direction every time. Well, pretty much just like everything on this guitar, this is fighting me too, and it's moving a tiny, tiny fraction off of center. I don't know if something's come loose or what. Uh, it just doesn't quit with me on this guitar. 
I'll finish the rest of it. What's that old Elvis song? It's now or never. Well, that's about where we're at. It's now or never. So I guess it's now because I don't know the word never. And I always use a paintbrush. I know most, a lot of people use a spatula or some, you know, leveling plastic type spatula tool for spreading glue, a glue spreader of some sort. But I prefer the paintbrush. I, I really do. On things like this, I like to paint it back and forth. I like to go in different directions. I don't want any surprise air bubbles. I want to make sure... 100% coverage. There's no other way to really do that. I mean, a spatula, you could kind of do that with that, but uh, I feel like the paintbrush does a better job. I have already lost the bridge. There's the bridge. I had lost it for a moment. Um, I've already scratched the back of the bridge with the tooth blade, and I have already cleaned it with acetone. I've got more glue on here than I need by quite a bit, actually. So I will get my glue off of here. I've said it many times, you don't rush this process. You take your time and get good glue coverage. And as long as you do that, you will have good results. I've got the bridge on there. I have the call up on the inside and I'm holding it in place. And hopefully my little girl wrists will allow enough room for the uh, clamp to get in there and my hand to get out of there. And so far that's holding true. And except for the fact that I forgot to add my little deal here, you know, as much as I've done this, I still get ahead of myself. And I think that's the main reason that I do get ahead of myself is because I've done it so much. Okay, I'm not tightening it very much yet. I'm just using a little bit of pressure so that I can line everything really good. These ends are not tight yet, and that's just barely tight. Now I want to get my mirror look up inside and make sure that everything looks good like I hope it does in there. Well, it doesn't look bad. It's just not quite what I was expecting. The call has slipped that way, and I would like for the call to come back to where I thought it should be. Let's see if I can get my hand in there and move the call back. Yep, I did. And see if I can still get things back in place. Well, every time I do that, the call is sticking to the clamp and I slide the clamp back. Let me try that again. There it is. Maybe this time it'll stay better. I think we can live with that one. And then we will put the other clamps in. Again, I've got them all pretty much about the same tension. Parking them down a little bit as I go, kind of like with the way you tighten down car tires, you just kind of even it out across all the nuts. And that's kind of the way I'm doing this. I'm just taking my time with it. And now I'm just going to start putting a little bit of pressure on these ends. Go back to these again, kind of make sure they're all equally tight. I like to make sure that the clamps are as tight as they can be pretty much. I'm not worried about squeezing all the glue out of the joint. I've never had that big a problem. Feels good now. It's pretty solid. Now we'll go around and clean off all the glue squeeze out and it looks pretty equal all the way around. It's from what I can see, it's about the same amount of glue squeeze out, which is a, generally a good indication that your clamps are on pretty steady. I will say my little bridge design's a little bit more tricky for cleaning up the glue. Not anything crazy hard, but a little more tricky. Anytime you alter something, there's always some kind of consequence. Putting those little points back there makes it a little more difficult to clean up the glue squeeze out, but nothing that we can't get around. You kind of have to clean up glue squeeze out two or three times because as those clamps settle in, the glue keeps squeezing out. Looks pretty darn good to me. Take a dry rag now and wipe it down really clean. Well, you know the drill, we'll come back in 24 hours. It's about 7.30 a.m. the following day. Though it's not been 24 hours, it's certainly been plenty long for the glue to be dry. We're gonna remove the clamps now and see what we ended up with. I believe it should be fine. Looks good to me, good and solid. Now we've gotta drill the holes through the rest of the way. It is that time. Today's date is April 9th. It's 3.51 in the afternoon, and it's just about time for this baby to be delivered. We're gonna start, I don't know all the little 
minor problems we're going to have setting it up. It's never had strings on it, obviously. So, you know, I've just kind of taken a best guess estimate as just a, a rough setup. The very first hurdle I'm running into is the pegs don't go all the way down in there. Before I even try putting strings on it, I'm going to address that issue. Not even sure if the peg reamer will start down in there. Not really. So I'm going to go ahead and drill it out with the next size uh, bit first. For the record, the holes were drilled with a 4.5 millimeter bit. This is a 5, so we're just going up a half a millimeter. Okay, the reamer will probably start in there now, I would think. Just barely. I'm kind of forcing the reamer in as I go, and I'm just trying to get it to where it'll touch my finger. I found that's about the right size. Right there, I can feel it. Well, uh, we may have to do some more work on that as we start putting the strings on it because the strings are going to take up a certain amount of space. These are real wood pegs. They're the snake wood that matches the tuning keys. Uh, again, they have the blunt end. I like to have a beveled end, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, I've got the little groove facing up, and I just file across both sides of that little groove. And for the most part, I just file until that groove more or less disappears across the front of the peg there. So I'll go in a little bit bigger file. There we go. Perfect. So that's what it looks like now. And I'll just, I'm just going to set that one in the first hole there. I'm going to do the rest of these the same way. I'm not going to film it to save some time. Well, with the usual caveats, I don't see anything else that's going to get in my way on stringing this up at the moment. I've already got some temporary grooves cut in the nut up here. They're not very deep. The nut itself is not very tall, so it won't need a very deep slot to begin with. It'll probably need to be deepened beyond what I have there. Okay, so let's see. Will this first string go in? It's going to be a tight fit, I'm sure, but it might go in. Yeah, it does. It just barely does. I think it's good enough, at least for the initial setup here. And now we're going to use my stringing method where I pull it tight, wind it around the post a turn and a half, and I go back through over the top of the string that's already there. These are the string, same strings that I use to set the intonation with, so they're bent on the end, makes it a little bit more difficult, but I should be able to get it through there. And then I just cut them off at the top of the string post. I'm not going to show putting on the rest of the strings. I'll give you my word, I won't make it make any sound until I get all the strings on there. Then we'll tune it up together. Uh, I can tell already the action's going to be crazy high. I did leave the saddle a little tall. But I, I may cut that down before I bring it back to you and show you because I can tell that's going to be really high. The strings are on here. The middle four are not tightened up at all. I tightened up the outer two just so I can kind of look at the uh, action because I can tell it's high. I'd like to get it in the ballpark before we even try to play it. Whoop, that's the first noise it made right there. Tighten that up a little bit more. Well, actually, that's not that bad. It's less than 100. It's about 95. That's not that bad. So maybe it's not as bad as I thought. Let's see what this side is. Pretty close to the same. It's a it's probably a little higher, probably about 115 on that side. Tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and take the saddle out. The arch might be just a little much for the radius of the fretboard. I'm gonna take a little bit of the arch out in the middle and knock it down a little bit on the treble side. I'm gonna leave the base just about where it is. That's, so that's kind of what I'm doing. Just And it's only gonna be a little bit. Got my tuner set right down in front of me here. I'll hold the guitar up where it's aimed up a little bit higher. And I'll be looking at this tuner as I tune it up. So these are the first noises this baby has made in a setup state. Got some deep tones coming out already, I can tell that. I'm going to put a little tension on every string. It's always good, in my opinion, to bring all your strings up, not just one string up. Spreads the stress out a little bit better, I think. slipped I believe I don't know where it slipped but it slipped somewhere
I do know it's gonna be loud. I know that. Just checking the pins, they're all in there. on my B string for some reason. I will say it's holding the note very well on the tuner. Like it's not wobbling at all. first chord it's ever made. I, my caveat is I almost guillotined that finger off on the end. So it's pretty tender. <laughs> but us old, old guys are tough, remember? <laughs> I like it. Everything's crisp, everything's clear. Just, I'm, you know, everything's gonna change on tuning for a while. I'm going to uh, just kind of work with it here off camera for a few minutes, just working up and down on the tuning and stretching the strings and things like that. No point wasting film on that or time on that. And then I'll bring you back when I feel like it's relatively stable and we'll play something on it. Actually, I've kind of decided that while it's under tension and before we really get serious about playing it for you, I am going to uh, adjust the action here at the nut. The nut's quite high. It's not crazy high, but it's high. So like, you know, roughly 35 thousandths here at the first, on this first one. I would like to get it down to about 18 thousandths. So it's roughly twice as high as I want it. Again, I'm not gonna film this you've seen me do these filings a million different times and uh, I'm just going to get it close and then I'll bring you back when we're ready to play it. Well, as bad as I hate to do it, I'm going to go ahead and take my band-aid off of the end of that finger there. It's all black and blue. <laughs> Like I said, us old guys are tough. It's only been about an hour since it was very first strung up, but it's incredibly stable. Uh, you pick a note on it and it just goes dead center in the tuner and just sits there. I just love that about the guitar. It's, it's loud, it's, got, it's crisp, it's clear. It's everything I wanted it's, and it's easy to play. I am in love with the guitar. Here's one last close up look at it. I am really happy with it. I like my bridge a lot. The sides are, I think, gorgeous. They wink at you. They've just got so much curl and beautiful color in that, in those sides. They're just gorgeous. The back is the same way. And again, of course, that homemade, um, I guess you'd call it purfling, I guess. The uh, herringbone purfling there, that wider stuff that I made. And of course, the end pin joint down there that I made. The back of the neck is kind of pretty as well, I think. Now, the only thing missing at the moment is the pick guard. Friends, just to prove further, it's just not easy to be me because I'm still not satisfied with this. I am going to take the finish off of this. After all the effort I've gone through to get a good finish on this, and it's still not that great because there's still, uh, this was a hole and I've, 
drop filled it. I haven't sanded it level. I'm pretty sure if I sanded it level and buffed it this time, I'd be happy with it. But rather than that, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm just gonna sand the whole finish right back off of it. And the reason is, I've decided it's going to look better on the guitar unfinished, just with the linseed oil coating on it. The linseed oil will match the fretboard better. It will match the uh, bridge better. So this is going to fit in better, I think, than with this shiny coating on it. And I think it's even going to look richer. I think it's even going to look more expensive rather than less with to get this shiny coating off of there. After all the work I did to put the coating on there, <laughs> So, you know, plans change. Here we go. I don't even know what grade this is. I'm just gonna start with that to see what happens. I mean, I could probably scrape it off and that would probably be better. And I may go to the scraper. I just thought I'd see how hard it is to sand it off first. I'd prefer to sand it off if it comes off easy, but I have a feeling it won't come off all that easy. The other option would be to just dull it down and leave it a satin finish. That's an option. And I might consider that here as I dull this down, but I don't think that's the option I want to go with. And, and that's too rough of a sandpaper to leave it like that, but I just, just kind of wanted to look at it and see if I think I might like a dull finish. But I, I really think I just want to get rid of the finish entirely. I've never had it stick to my razor blade before, but it's coated up, stuck to my razor blade even. A lot thicker coating than I thought I had on there, so it's not going to be easy, just like always. Yeah, I had to go to the bigger gun here. I've got the uh, scraper. This will take it off in no time. I'm just trying to be very careful that I'm not scraping the wood. And, you know, it, it just takes practice there. You can pretty much control with the scraper just how much you're taking off. And there will be microscopic amounts of wood coming off in places, but it'll be very minimal. This will let me get it down to bare wood quickly and then I can sand it smooth. See, that's all bare wood in that area now. Just about there. It only takes a couple of minutes to get the finish off of something with a scraper if you know how to use it. People always ask me what how do I get the finish off of an instrument if I want to refinish it? And that's how I do it. I don't use chemicals on them, especially on guitars because of the plastic binding and the plastic pick guard and things. You will also destroy the plastics if you use chemicals. So you're better off just learning to use a scraper and yeah, it's a little more labor intensive, a little more elbow grease, but if you learn how to use it, it's actually pretty easy. It doesn't take very long at all. Just as important as learning how to use a scraper is learning how to sharpen a scraper. And I do have a video or two out there somewhere where I've explained how to sharpen a scraper. You basically sharpen it pretty much like you sharpen a knife. The difference is that after you get it really sharp, and I mean like razor sharp where it will shave hair, then you burnish the edge over with a burnishing tool so that the, there's a curl so that very sharp edge is curled over like a hook kind of like that and so you're scraping with that hook I've got the camera zoomed up so much it's hard to show that but I think you got the idea but anyway that's pretty much it the edges are a little bit shiny still so I'm gonna have to get in here lightly with the scraper and just knock the edges down a little bit because I don't want them to be Showing up shiny when everything else is dull. I gotta be careful here on this end that I don't chip the end out. It's pretty good. And here I want to go this way till about center, roughly about down to the lowest point there. And then I wanna turn around and go this way. Otherwise I, I risk breaking that tip off. It's important to know which way your grain is so that you don't pull against the grain. You wanna go with the grain on something like this. And even that is still a little tedious. You wanna be careful that you're not pressing too hard and break that tip off. That would be ugly at this stage of the game. You'd see a grown man cry. That's good enough for now. Clean up the mess here and then we'll do some sanding. I've got the uh, mess cleaned up and now I'm going to sand it smooth and get rid of any little scraping marks that would be there. There's really not much in the way of marks. It's just getting it 
smooth enough to put the linseed oil on it. it. Shouldn't take much. I think I've got 220 here. I think that's what I've got. Maybe it's 400. Just a small piece of sandpaper without the actual grade on it. I'd say it's 400 is what it feels like. I believe that'll do. Now we'll put the oil onto it and uh, watch it wake up. We're going to uh, put the boiled linseed oil on here right now. I believe that's going to make it look really, really nice and really rich looking. Yeah, that looks beautiful. That just looks gorgeous. Having trouble with the lighting in my new area. Haven't got it figured out yet, but there you go. That looks rich in my opinion. I think that's going to match, but much better. We'll show you what it looks like laying on the guitar now. Well, there I have it set just about where it's going to go. I need to re-oil this again to make it match it better, but overall, I think it really does look nice. I think it just looks even more rich that way than it does with the shiny look. So I think that's going to be awesome. I have completely resanded the top of the guitar. I started at 400 and went all the way to 2000. I'm pretty happy with it now. So now I'm going to take the semi-chrome polish and start buffing it out by hand. I've got a, a damp rag here, it's just damp, and I put it on in a circular motion, just work it in like that. A lot of elbow grease. These shop towels also add a, a layer of buffing to it as well. It really does turn out nice when you use them. It's drying out a little fast on me, so it's a little hard to remove. You might have to take your damp rag and, and dampen it again before you can really buff it out good. It's not perfect yet, but hopefully you can see the difference in the shine on this side and the dull, dullness on this side. It's pretty dull over here, and then it gets pretty crisp and sharp over here. It's just slightly above a semi-gloss, I would think. I'm not gonna show any more of that. That's what I'm doing, and I'll bring you back when we're finished with that. We're going to uh, do the final step on buffing out this top now. I'm gonna put the uh, Renaissance wax on it. Because we've got bare wood here and bare wood here, I'm going to coat those with linseed oil one more time before I wax it because I'm afraid the wax could get on here a little bit and then the linseed oil wouldn't soak in properly. Here we go with that first. And I'm going to try to keep the linseed oil, of course, off the top of the guitar, but it's not as bad. If it gets on there, all I have to do is just wipe it off really well shouldn't be a problem on top of the finish. Well, the whole fretboard has to be cleaned and leveled and recrowned and all that yet, so the fretboard's not done at all. I'm just putting this on here as a safety precaution in case I get wax on here. I've already put several coats of linseed oil on this bridge, so it's coated pretty well already, but I wanted a fresh coat just in case the wax does get on there. That looks really rich. Okay, now I'm just going to wipe along the edge of the parts here in case there's any oil that got on there. And now we're ready for the Renaissance wax. A number of folks have started using the Renaissance wax and many of them have told me how nice they think it is as well. I, you know, paste waxes, are, I'm not going to lie to you, they're much harder to apply. Uh, takes elbow grease, takes a lot more work and time, but if you have an acoustic instrument, you want to protect the finish and you want to improve the sound as well, then get yourself a good paste wax. Even a furniture paste wax is better, in my opinion, than those liquid polishes they sell for instruments. I don't like the liquid polishes at all. You've heard me say that several times. This makes it slick. It's so slick now, it's like there's no friction there at all. Well, now for my uh, standard statement, and that is no matter how good you get it, you always want it better. But I do have it uh, waxed all over. It does feel just as slick as snot on a doorknob. So it's, it's pretty nice. Debating now, I think I'm gonna go ahead and give this one more coat of linseed oil. And then I think I'm gonna put this in place. So let's give it the linseed oil treatment first. And once again, to avoid the questions, it's always boiled linseed oil when you see me using linseed oil. Just wanna work it in really well. And then I just want to dry it off. Almost as quick as I put it on, I dry it right back off. And sometimes, especially it seems like on fretboards, 
you'll have to come back in another five minutes and wipe it down one more time because the oil will find its way back out of the pores of the wood. But for right now, I think we're finally at the piece de resistance moment. Whatever that means, I have no idea. And I'm going to stick it on there. I've just got to decide exactly how I think it looks best. That's just about how it looks best right there, I think. I think that's where she's going to live. That's, uh, you know, there's ways to do this. Um, I just generally do it by eye. I mean, there's ways you can tape it down and things, but keep in mind, this is not flexible at all. It's wood. It's a little more complicated, maybe. I'm going to use the hover method, kind of like the method some of the ladies use in the ladies' restroom, right? The hover method. And that looks pretty darn good right there. I believe that's where that pick guard lives now. I wanted to wait till I got the wax on it. I kind of felt like the wax would give it just that much more ability to stick. I feel like it's stuck down pretty good. Now I'm gonna move on and do the fret job. I'm not even gonna film it. I'm just gonna level and recrown the frets, oil the fretboard. When I bring it back, we'll be strung up again. Well, I told you I wasn't gonna film this, but then as I just started this, I thought, you know, I just got another one of those nasty comments. The guy says, you obviously don't know anything. Using the uh, crowning file without taping it off, I'm out of here. You know, well, I just replied back to his comment and said, I'm sorry, you just don't know anything. That's more or less what I said. And then I blocked him from the channel so that he doesn't have to watch it. I know it upsets him and I wouldn't want him to get upset. But my point is, if you need to tape this off, if that's your skill set and that's your skill level and if you're just that extra cautious, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. Some people would read into that that I'm being a smart aleck. I'm not. If that's the way you feel you need to do it, do it that way. I got no problem with that. I've done it that way myself. I just don't do it that way anymore. It takes too much time to tape it off and I never have a real problem. So why tape it off? Even if I slip, and I occasionally do slip, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's not that hard to fix the problem. So I would rather fix the problem than spend all that extra time taping off. That's why I do it this way. If you need to do it a different way, please do it a different way. Okay, I'm not filming any more of it. Now you heard me rant. Well, my friends, I have already leveled and recrowned all of the fret, and uh, they're all in good shape. And I've also leveled the fretboard with the razor blade. Kind of got ahead of myself there. Typically, I don't do that until after I polish all the frets with sandpaper. But, and typically, I polish them this way, which I know is contrary to everybody else, but I do it that way for speed, and it works really good, and it makes them nice and slick, and, and with 600 sandpaper, you cannot feel a single groove anywhere, and they string slide perfectly. But because I got ahead of myself, I've already leveled the fretboard. I'm not going to sand it this way. I'm gonna go ahead and just sand it yeah, the traditional way. And I just put two post-it notes on there, and I've got 600 sandpaper. I just go across it like that, it, just for a few seconds. It only takes a few seconds per fret, really. And it does a really nice job. It makes them just as slick as they can be. And I kind of work on both sides of the fret and crown the fret and everything. You know, I don't, I don't want to take any height off the fret, you understand. It's another reason I don't want to spend a lot of time there doing that. I just want to get it polished up and move on. My friends, it's time to put the label in the guitar. I've got it all made up here. The serial number is 48i7GVSR. That means it's the 48th instrument, the seventh guitar made at the Valley Springs Ranch here. Once I get it more or less where I want it, I just take the paintbrush and just kind of level it out and stick it down real good. Maybe you can see it in there. Get the light in the right direction. It's really hard to get good lighting in this situation here I think but anyway it's in there just so you know well friends we're in luck before I have to ship this Carolina Rose guitar off my good buddy Don Davis from the band uh, is 
agreed to play it for us here. Now, Don is a finger style picker. He picks a little bit on the style of Chet Atkins and maybe a little Merle Travis thrown in there every once in a while. And uh, Don is a very good picker. Self admits that he doesn't play real loud. This is not really to show off the volume, but I think you'll see some really beautiful music coming out of it and some really neat tone coming out of it. And so I think you're going to enjoy this. So Don, I'm going to turn you loose. What are you going to play first? Uh, I'm going to try a little bit of that Silver Bells. And, uh... Sound. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. did a nice job picking that too. That was called mm -hmm. Silver Bells, is that right? Silver Bells. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, Have uh, you got another one you want to lay on us? Um, might try a little bit of wheels. I'll see if I can do that. All right. I, I really like the tone. It's got a, a good bass tone, and just all the way through, it's really and volume. I'll try that wheel some little bit here. Okay. guitar also it's just kind of unique in every way it's, uh, every everything you look about it it's it's different but it's yeah it's it's, uh, it's a little beautiful. different yeah but in it and I like this uh, armrest oh yeah kinda well good takes that sharp edge off there. that's right that's what I think and it looks neat you know it just kind of got a different look to it that way mm -hmm. with that armrest let me see if I can do a little bit of a Think of the name of it now, but I'll think of the name. That's all right.
I'll see you in my dreams. I'll see I mean, you in my dreams. That was cool. That was very good. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the gentleman that gets this guitar is really gonna, really gonna enjoy it. Well, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate you playing it for us. Before I uh, let Don get out of here, I thought maybe we could just jam on a tune or two. Um, this is one that I like to play. Uh, Don uh, said he hadn't really played this one, but he's, he did a good job just improvising here off camera just a moment ago. So we're going to give it a shot. It's called uh, When You and I Were Young Maggie. It goes something like this. playing and uh, we're going to try one that uh, I've never done it in in this particular key before but I'm having fun playing and trying it in this key and that is the Kentucky Waltz. We're going to play it in the key of G and uh, just have a little fun just improvising and jamming to it. So here we go. <laughs>
Awesome, awesome, that was fun. That one almost got away from me, but I held on by the skin on my teeth. <laughs> Don's gonna play another tune for you now in his finger style, and I think it's called Oh By Jingle. So here we go. That's really good. I haven't done that in much. <laughs> Sounded good to me. <laughs> One of the tunes that we play in the RSW band is a gospel tune called uh, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Beverly usually sings a little bit of it and uh, I believe she plays the bass on it, doesn't mm -hmm. she? Yeah. And, and, and Don picks the guitar on it and pretty much most of the time I just stay out of it. But uh, we're going to jam to it right now. Uh, it's in the key of E if you're keeping score out there. <laughs> fun well it's finally time to say goodbye to the guitar so here's one last close-up look I really couldn't be much more happy with it you know you always want a little bit more than what you get so I always want something a little bit better but I gotta tell you this is a nice guitar that's all I can really say there's a good look at the old pick guard there I love that bridge it just seems perfect. There's the uh, place for the, uh, the strap button there. You can see those sh sides just shining and glowing. It's just really a, a pretty guitar. It's a one of a kind. You know, I, I hate to use words like it's kind of a work of art, but it kind of is. Uh, it's just really a, a nice guitar. And to boot, it's got a sound just really as good as any guitar you're going to find. Very clear, very clean, real even. Just as even as it can be. I picked the same old tunes because I can't pick many on a guitar. Yeah, it's got sustain, you know, it just forever. 
Yeah, and I love the, the binding and that little armrest thing. It just, it just adds, you know, to the beauty of it. It's, you know, you may or not, may not think that you need that armrest. Uh, arm relief is really what it is. Um, but I'll tell you what, you know, the older you get, the better that feels. <laughs> it's just, it's just got the punch. Just, it's really got a lot of punch. You know, it's just going to get better as the finish dries. I mean, the finish is still green. Yeah, I, I really honestly couldn't be much happier with it. Thought I'd show you the case that I'm sending with the guitar. It's a Hiscox case. They're very nice cases. Very, you know, uh, very well made. Plush linings. Typical guitar case, but a very nice molded case. So, should provide a lot of protection. I just want to thank you for watching the series on this guitar. Thank you for your patience and finally getting it out. Even though we've called this guitar the Carolina Rose, it's on its way now to Florida because the Carolina Rose owner moved to Florida during the build. And so it's now going to be a Florida peach. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, we hope that uh, you've enjoyed it and thank you so much for staying with me on the build. If you'd like to see one more song, me singing and playing the uh, guitar, well then tune in to the same number as this video here with an S at the end. Thank you so much. Blah, blah.